Welcome to this installment of Two Healthcare Guys. Uh, with us is Jake, and uh, Jake, you and I met actually over on LinkedIn because I am a frequent reader of the Imaging Wire. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, you should be, but Jake, can you tell, us, tell everyone a little bit about the Imaging Wire and, and how you got into it? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. And uh, you have excellent taste in newsletters. Thank you for, for all those posts, Kyle. Uh, so essentially what the Imaging Wire is, is it's a twice weekly uh, radiology and medical imaging newsletter. Uh, and what we try to do is make it as quick and easy as possible for imaging professionals to be caught up. So we take essentially all the most important or interesting stories and whittle them down to somewhere between one and three sentences for most stories. And essentially what you can do if this was a normal year is, you know, while you're on the train platform or while you're eating your cereal, you can essentially be completely caught up in about eight to 10 minutes. And that way uh, you're a bit smarter about your industry and it doesn't take you all day to, to get there. Well, you know, when we, when we first started talking, I was uh, expecting you to, you know, tell me about your lengthy medical imaging background, how many different PAX companies you've worked for, because the writing's great and it's really succinct. You know, I thought you were an imaging guy and uh, I was actually pretty shocked. So. How did you get into this? Or, or yeah. tell, where, where, what is your background, and then how did you get into this? Got it. Okay, I'm almost an imaging guy. We're almost at three years now, so I don't know. Maybe when I hit the five year mark, uh, I won't be faking it anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay. Well, my best friend from high school. What's up, Chuck? If you're watching this, uh, is the MRI tech. But that was essentially my only connection to the imaging industry when I launched the newsletter. So I came up with the idea for the newsletter more based on the premise that it's important to be news literate, but people don't have time. Um, and then kind of found my way to healthcare because it made, uh, it's interesting and important and also kind of made financial sense. And then made my way to medical imaging for really the same reasons. Um, and uh, I just started writing. I wrote the first one on a plane one day and then I uh, just kind of did it again the next day and then built the website and just went from there. So I started off with, I think 17 subscribers and that like includes my mom and my sister and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But now we have a really good group of people and uh, it's been wonderful meeting folks in this industry and everybody's lifers. I have so mm -hmm. many subscribers who have like Gmail addresses to say like x-ray Steve at gmail.com. And that's a, that's a big commitment to this being your job for the rest of your life. Right. Cause you don't change your, uh, your Gmail address and, that's what I found, and people are really passionate, and it's been it's been a pleasure. That's really cool. Uh, so, what was? Do you recall the moment where like this really inspired you? And like, man, I have to, I need to talk about this. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's, the reason I started writing it that, that day was actually I was coming back from um, a uh, uh, my grandmother was was passing away, and it was kind of like a you only live once type of moment. So when I was flying mm. back on that flight, that was actually it. Um, but the thing about I just medical imaging felt important. I mean, every important healthcare thing that's ever happened to me or to family members who I love, the imaging has been involved. Uh, and I think that's true for everybody. Um, and then, you know, I did a little bit of research and I found that, um, that uh, it's, you know, it's super important from both clinically and then also just like the economics of healthcare. Uh, as far as the reasons why I um, kind of had that revelation that it's important to be news literate, but people don't have time, is just uh, I, I spent a long part of my career working at a market intelligence firm. Okay. Uh, wonderful company, great clients, uh, and really smart analysts just pumping out great research. Uh, and it was always a challenge to understand that you know, you're going to write something that's big and beautiful, but not a lot of people are going to have time to read it. So this is me trying to solve that problem. Oh, I like that. Cool. Well, and I love those sound bites because I can, I can quickly read through something and it's like, like an abstract. I can decide, do I really want to read? Do I want to invest the two to five minutes to go read the actual article? And, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but it's, it's a great way, I, you know, to kind of decide where to spend my time. Absolutely. There's, I saw this figure that the average online article uh, has a like 17 second churn point. 
that people essentially spend 17 seconds to decide if they want to dedicate seven minutes to that subject. But most of my stories you can read in 17 seconds anyway. So <laughs> um, smart. Yeah. 17 seconds. Really? That's yeah. Um, now that you, it sounds really short, but when you say it, like, that's what I do. Like, I, I just kind of go quickly. Am I interested? Am I interested? Yeah. You know, one, uh, we're busy, right? You can't spend seven minutes on something that isn't going to be fulfilling or, uh, I don't know. It's, you have to prove up front that it's going to be worth that person's time. So if they can get the big picture in, uh, you know, two, three, four, five sentences, and then decide if they want to spend all that time, they can click the link and go. You know, someone uh, was at a conference, and I think I think it was David Merman Scott meant, said that uh, attention is the new currency, and that's that's kind of what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Is you know, where do I, where's my attention going to go? And that that's a really quick decision. Right. So, I agree. So I'm kind of interested in, and as an outsider, you know, we all have our pet theories about what's going on in the industry. What a what are some of the trends that you see going on or, or what things interest you that you see happening in, in imaging, medical imaging, or even just healthcare? Right. Um, oh man, there's so many. So, I mean, one is just this, uh, there's like, I guess maybe two things that I see that are like of really big importance and influence. And one is just new technologies coming in and uh, new processes getting better and having to get better because of just the, the incredibly high volumes that all these uh, folks in the industry are facing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so on the, the technology side, of course, I mean, I think the biggest one, the first one most folks have talked about is artificial intelligence. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's huge and there's so much buzz. I think that any given week, if I really wanted to, I could have every single article I cover be about AI. Uh, and it's, they would probably get a ton of clicks too. People are super interested in it. Um, uh, the ironic thing is that there's a, a big gap between the interest and the focus and the, the funding towards AI and kind of where it is right now from an industry perspective. Uh, I had somebody tell me probably about a year ago that if imaging AI was a baseball game, it wouldn't even be the first inning. People would be like driving to the game and making their way into the stadium. That we're, mm. we're super early. And kind of what that means is that um, there's a lot of FDA clearance announcements and a lot of funding announcements and a lot of really smart people working on really cool products uh, or tools. But in the clinic, it's a, it's a smaller part of a lot of radiologists' jobs. Um, and, and that's okay, because that's where we are in the ball game. Um, I would say it's an even smaller part of kind of the economics of the industry that most of the firms are still working off of their venture uh, capital funding. There's not a lot of profitable dollars being made. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not reimbursements for using AI. So even if it saves lives or gets efficiencies, it's hard to get a healthcare executive to, to drop some money on it if if they're not really, really sure. So it just shows how, how early we are. Once again, that's okay. A baseball game still happens even if it's before the baseball game. But yeah, that's an excellent point, you know, talking about reimbursement and you have this uh, dynamic technology that clearly they know that it can improve uh, efficiencies because of automation and it's usually associated with AI. So I think that's, that's one of the, I don't know if it's a problem to solve or if, if and Kyle chime in here, or if that is just part of the technology that's still young and evolving. So it should be linked to something to where it's justifiable and they're no longer look at the cost of the AI to look at how that drives the outcome, you know, being more patient centric. Totally. What do you think, Kyle? You know, I think AI is the technology is coming. It's is it? It's not quite there, and it, it will be. I think a lot of it comes down to the training, uh, not necessarily having enough data available to do proper proper training of the AI. There's bias in the AI, and then you know, I, I hate to say it, but the hype cycle, like the hype cycle, is just in overdrive, particularly with AI stuff. So it's really, really hard for most people to figure out what's, what's real, what, what's, what's really happening, what really works versus what is just, you know, vaporware and marketing. And I, and I hate that because it, it sets people's expectations the wrong, wrong. And people are, um, get frustrated when they don't get the results they, 
that, that they read in that that one page white paper. Right, and um, I uh, actually have I'm stealing this from uh, a sponsor of mine, Arteris, but they they would kind of echo your your statement there. And one of the things they say is that you know only five percent of the ROI you're going to get for from AI is the software itself, and the rest is kind of wrapping your processes around that, and getting mm -hmm. integrated, and measuring your outcomes, and going back and trying to improve. Uh, and there are success stories from, I'd say, all if not most of the, um, or most if not all of the AI leaders. But it you know it takes work, and and probably the lagging indicator is those. Uh, is the kind of data evidence to show that it, it works and that's what's keeping a lot of folks from from adopting it you know i'm i'm a little bit in the minority and so people you know might might poo poo this but i think that many of the real benefits that we can get out of ai and i'll, I'll quote one of my friends his name is max ma he's a was a data scientist at microsoft and he called it blue collar ai he said don't go don't swing for the fence find a simple repeatable task you know, plebeian, if you will, and let AI do the simple stuff over and over and over and free up people's time to do the more complex tasks. And I feel like yeah. we're, we're chasing the sexy answer, you know, oh, you know, diagnose this and do that. And we're chasing the hard problems when there's a lot, you know, lower, low hanging fruit out there that would be really, really ideal. And we just don't seem to be chasing that. Agreed. I mean, it, it, image interpretation is just like such a nice fit that it's hard for people to kind of move away from from that, um, but I completely agree, and I've heard folks say that before. And uh, you know, they'll say, "Because one of the promises for AI is like, hey, we're going to get rid of all your tedious work and allow you to do all this really fun stuff." Uh, and a lot of writers say, "Well, my most tedious stuff isn't the image interpretation; it's it's all the other things." So, like, let's build some of those the blue car AI, and I like that term right? around uh, the stuff that I went to school until I was thirty six for, <laughs> and. Uh, I think that's pretty fair. You know, I got one for you. Give me an AI that can um, figure out how to put together a spreadsheet so I don't sit there like clicking and moving and resizing columns. Like, you know, that, I mean, I, it sounds silly, but how much time do you spend formatting papers and formatting things, which are like, that's that should be like the simplest task in the world, yet we all spend forever trying to get it just right. 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 Yeah, it's a, that's a really bad example. Just forget I said that. <laughs> we get your point. Oh, man. <laughs> ED, right? How is AI, do you have modality vendors who talk about AI when it comes to point of care? Is that something that you see is gaining traction? Big chunks of that. Yeah, I think he was asking about AI from the modality side. And oh, yeah. Particularly. Oh, yeah like point of care ultrasound yeah okay there's some real world stuff that's working on the the modality side now um so with ct and with mri the uh, imagery construction so allowing you know higher quality scans uh in shorter time with less radiation uh that's awesome and it's it's helping now and you don't need to convince a radiologist or uh, somebody else to kind of adopt into the workflow it's built into the machine and on the ultrasound side, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some really cool stuff, particularly around handheld ultrasounds, where um, the whole idea of handheld ultrasounds is it's bringing it to the point of care and it's being administered by a clinician who might not be trained uh, as a sonographer. Um, and with this AI guidance uh, ultrasound, you know, folks who aren't experts can perform scans like experts. And it's super cool when it uh, it's crucial for the whole point of care ultrasound uh, value proposition and kind of business plan to work, right? They need it to get into thousands and thousands of hands, and they can't train thousands and thousands of people to be sonographers. So uh, that's how it's going to happen. And it's, it seems like it's working, and it, it actually seems really cool. Well, well to quote, quote you now, um, I think this very week there was an article about uh, a, a blind study where uh, nurses with one hour of training using point of care ultrasound were compared to stenographers, stenographers not stenographers, sonographers. Hard one. Big, big difference. Big difference. Sorry, y'all. Um, <laughs> and then there was a uh, RADS were uh, evaluating it. And then there was also maybe a month ago 
a DARPA uh, contract was put out to do a point of care ultrasound in the field for certain certain things. Because I think that's what it was. Yeah, and both the same idea. So one is just um, uh, well, the one the first one you mentioned that that was they were using uh, caption AI or caption help uh, uh, ultrasound technology to essentially allow nurses, like you said, with one hour training to perform uh, cardiac scans just as well as trained cardiographers uh, or cardiac sonographers. And um, and then, yeah, the Pentagon sees value in it. And they essentially said that, hey, we'll give a million dollars if you can come up with an algorithm that um, allows us to perform AI guided ultrasounds, you know, on the battlefield. And those, the folks out on the battlefield, uh, Priority number one is to learn how to be on the battlefield. They can't spend all their time learning how to administer ultrasound. So um, it makes sense, and it shows that uh, it just kind of, like you said, just illustrates all the different applications for it. Yeah, it's neat stuff. And then other modalities. I know there's a. <clears throat> we've actually used AI for a really long time in uh, breast tomography and breast imaging. Yeah, um, I've yeah. got a friend over at. Uh, that, that's doing some good work there and that's particularly with tomography which has really radically changed uh, the breast care in terms of the volumes and the amount of data to be be looked at so that's another one where you know, ai is looking at i think more of a prioritization of you know what what do i need to look at versus what not not diagnosing but just trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and, and say spend your time like we were saying before spend your time looking here right then you can decide whether to double click and go deeper. <laughs> right, right. Wait, how's my mic? Is it better now? Yeah. Oh, right and then it doesn't. I'm gonna I'm gonna play the technical difficulties music when I when I edit this later. <laughs> So, all right, Jake, I, I want to ask you something just uh, as, a, as an outsider, you know, what do you think um, you, you mentioned in your 20, you know, what to look for in 2021 mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, I think there's mergers and acquisitions in the provider space. So different hospital groups, particularly, you know, with the financial setbacks of 2020, but there's also mergers, acquisitions and the um, <clears throat> corporation or institutionalization of radiology practices yeah you know what what are your thoughts on you know there you go talk <laughs> <laughs> well um man it's such a uh, sensitive subject that maybe i'll just share my observations and not my thoughts before i start getting some hate mail fair enough um, um so yeah so i started right in the office industry in uh like spring 2018 and i remember right away just covering a sequence of acquisitions from radiology partners and what they've done just in the last couple of years in terms of just expanding their network across America is, is it's been amazing. And it's also been amazing to see all the other uh, private equity backed groups really just uh, strengthen their hold. And uh, I say amazing and probably people who rely on their whole career uh, going through the partner path that they expected when they entered the specialty view it as uh, more concerning than amazing. Um, right. That a lot of them, you know, when they made this decision, they, they kind of had their career figured out for them. And it was, you know, you work really hard and you become a partner and you make a lot of money and it's great. Um, and for some of them who are able to sell to these corporate interests, then it's just a wonderful exit. And for other folks who are a little bit earlier in their career, they're, faced with a tough decision. Um, and uh, some of them would say that it's risks, I guess, less fulfilling careers, or uh, maybe there will be some steps that are skipped for uh, care that might be worse for the patients. And then, you know, if you look at some of the stuff that the major groups are doing, I mean, they're uh, bringing in efficiencies that we've never had before and doing things with AI that we're not seeing from the small practices and, you know, in many ways, driving the industry forward. So, um, you know, there's arguments on both sides. I've always been kind of a free market guy. So I'm not going to say like, hey, you're not allowed to buy a bunch of practices or anything like that. 
uh, but the market will decide, right? And if it truly is bad for patients and it truly is an unsustainable business model, which is what some folks say, then the market will dictate that eventually. Um, and if it's not, or if there's room for both, which, you know, there's a possibility, then we'll see that too. Uh, but no matter what, it's been massive uh, and it's been, um, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who are really concerned about what this means for them. You know, I, I agree. There's a lot of talk about it and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm all for open dialogue. So, you know, just kind of put it out there and say, I think um, there's obviously some, some fear based. And I think people are, like you said, are reevaluating their careers because where some people used to look at that as a path to you know, being partnered, like at a, a law firm. Um, now you're, I'm seeing people are, and I hate to say job hopping, but are looking at their early and mid career as opportunities to move around and find the right group that has the right culture, the right fit, the right location, like, like any job. And so those, that's a very different shift. And to have both of those exist in the same industry is interesting. Um, you know, some of the, the positives of that PE backing is that there's a lot more capital to buy new, better technology. I, I see rad groups as investing more in AI than I see hospitals and providers, just, you know, from, you know, my kind of on the periphery. So I think you're right. Time will tell. I mean, I, I been, I've seen, you know, all sides of that. And I, I guess I, I haven't seen the, the real negative impacts that we were afraid of, but again, you, I, you said it best time will tell. I don't know. Kyle, we have, I mean, Wayne, do we have you back? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, How's it? So. Oh, Hey, Saturday. all right. You have to get good off to the have you back, buddy. Thank you. Apologize. It's all good. Any thoughts yeah. on Consolid practice consolidation. Oh man, um, has it stopped? <laughs> <laughs> it, it it does seem like it's slowed. Um, yeah, I, I think that twenty twenty was a weird year to make like a big ambitious move. Um, so you know, I, I guess, yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, um, I mean, how much larger can the radiology groups get? I mean, they're already so large as it is. They have huge lobbying power. Uh, they have a lot of what I call intellectual muscle now to go out there and negotiate how they want to work. Uh, you know, when COVID hit, a lot of them came forward and said, hey, guys, we can't continue to do, um, you know, agreed volumes. We got to just work with what we have and, and be focused on these acute cases, and we'll get to the rest of the stuff while we can. I've heard things from all over the map. Does that ring true with you? Yeah. Should be. Interesting to see how things continue over these next two years. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of these groups, they, uh, they've they been off a lot, right? So they have some chewing to do uh, before they can uh, figure yeah. out, you know, uh, the next step. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's a lot of infrastructure to, to scale up, you know, and infrastructure in terms of automation, equipment, then even you know, like all of the, internal processes, you know, when you're starting to, as you're acquiring new practices, just that, I mean, just think of the, the data center required to, to run those kind of massive systems and, and the, and the networking. So there's a, there's a lot, a lot to it. Um, right. Right. So I don't know, let's see, we, we had on a point of care ultrasound, we were talking about AI. Gosh. We could talk a little bit more about point of care ultrasound. So we hit on it a little bit from AI guidance. Um, Right. I mean, it goes even further than that. Uh, just in terms of, um, I mean, so if you say, look at what uh, Butterfly Ultrasound is doing, Butterfly Network's doing, um, mm -hmm. they talk about democratizing imaging. And to a certain extent, you know, that's what they're doing. So uh, their goal is that that their scanner becomes as ubiquitous as the stethoscope and really becomes a stethoscope as the future not just uh, in hospitals here or in you know, doctor's offices here, but you know, in emerging countries where they really haven't had access uh, up until now. So how would they do that? What, how do they go out there and, and, and do it at that scale? Uh, so, well, uh, really good marketing, which they, they're excellent at. They're the best marketers I've ever seen in this industry. Um, but, uh, and then it's gonna take a lot of money. Uh, okay. Even at two thousand bucks a pop, uh, they, you know, 
if you're really going to get it into the hands of uh, you know all of these nurses and physicians that have never uh, that don't typically touch an ultrasound and now they're supposed to have one in their jacket pocket. Wow. Uh, it's going to take some big investments from the hospitals to do that. And then uh, they all come with a $65 a month to, I'm not sure what the, the enterprise version uh, month subscription fee is. So they're, they're actually kind of like a SaaS company that just has a $2,000 buy-in at the front. Um, so, it, and there's other handheld up sounds, both from the major OEMs and then other startups too. So, uh, you know, if this happens, then it's going to completely change the way that you know, who performs imaging and where it's performed. Yeah. And, you know, who knows if it actually hits the scale that they envision. Um, but it is, we're seeing more and more, the idea of, you know, an emergency room doctor having a point of care ultrasound in their pocket is not far-fetched at all. I mean, they're, they're doing this stuff now. Um, we have seen some kind of turf wars pop up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where, yeah, where the, uh, the major radiologist societies have essentially said like, you know, they're not comfortable with the idea of all of a sudden within their hospital, there's a hundred clinicians who are performing scans and performing image interpretation have never done that before. Mm. Um, so they're essentially trying to roll out or uh, set their own policies and say like, here, here's our policy. And our policy is like, this stuff still goes to radiology and you have to be trained and there has to be some type of accreditation. Well, that that sounds reasonable, right? I think so too. <laughs> um, it, but the folks say in the ER who have been using point of care ultrasound for years and years are like, yeah, that's a great policy. We've been doing this for five years. Like, uh, can't okay. put, the, put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, that's that's true. I think it just comes down to uh, when you talk about point of care, especially in the uh, ED, right? Um, are they are they only doing are they doing everything that comes in that that suspect or maybe they don't have the time to, to get it to radiology is that how it's being you know managed uh i mean there's like specific indications that they would use a handheld ultrasound and then you know they still have the heart based ultrasounds that are you know far more common for the same reason that i have my you know cell phone right there but we're talking on my computer and they just they do different things right. um, but the thing that's going to get into all these hands and really make that the handheld ultrasound business model work is uh, kind of going from kind of niche adoption or certain EDs or certain indications to it really replacing the stethoscope. So like the um, butterfly network went public, uh, I guess last week is kind of, it's one of those blank check things or SPAC things. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a while coming. But their market cap is $4.2 billion or something like that. And they made $63 million in revenue last year. Yeah. So, wow. That's yeah. That shows you the market. That's yeah. They're just scratching the surface, right? If, if they could go out there, they could scale us out to other countries. I mean, that right. that'll double easily yeah, on yeah. on the evaluation. So, so in the world, I mean, I mean, go ahead, Kyle. Go oh, ahead. sorry. I, what I what I've read and what I think is really a brilliant strategy is um <clears throat> is not necessarily marketing to um to entrenched doctors because you know doctors kind of they do what they're going to do and you know, they're somewhat immune to a lot of that marketing but they're going to medical schools oh yeah and so a really smart strategy is go get grants to put these devices in the hands of med students and Mm -hmm. residents as they're being trained and so they're going to come out and go to hospitals already trained on the device and expecting that that's just the standard of care that's how PAX really took off was back when people came in and said man i've been using this for two years why don't you have it yep and you know, genius. Go ahead. Go ahead. and just like you said, you know, when, when people say, well, but you're not trained, well, actually I am. <laughs> and I think that'll change the market because it'll change the expectations and what is, you know, what is the standard of care and then make it seem a little less, uh, I want to say gimmicky, but I don't mean that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I completely agree with you. They're going to come out of medical school, uh, handheld sound natives and butterfly natives. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, there's so much um, uh, publicity that comes from it. So every time they do one of those, uh, you know, all these guys are on Twitter, and next thing you know, Twitter's blowing up because everybody C Irvine or where Cornell or University of Indiana all got their handhelds. And uh, you'll see the comments under them. You know, usually like corporate account Twitter isn't necessarily like the most exciting thing in the world. 
um, in the comments under them like, I want one, I just ordered one for fun. And uh, it, there's a, a long tail to that too. Uh, in addition to just creating these natives, it's, it's cool to see. Well, and I was, I'll tell you, I was on the fence for a while. And, and I remember it was early last year, someone shared with me an article, you know, and, and I, I didn't check the veracity of it. So I don't know if it's like true, true history or not, but it was a, an article about the, about the thermometer and mm. this wild technology and that, you know, patients weren't, couldn't possibly understand the medical implications of this new device. And it was, it was, and again, I don't remember if it was satire or not, but the idea was this was like this new scary technology. And then now it's some, it's so common. It's just common. And I think that might be what we're seeing is just this, um, it's just new fear of change. Yeah. No, I, I love that example. Yeah. Me too. Now, like the bouncer at the restaurant takes your temperature before you go in. because it's comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you thin. That's where you thin fast. Um, no, but this has been, this has been really good. This has been good stuff. I mean, so I, Jay, tell me more about what's the vision for imaging wire. I mean, you're you're capable of obviously having access to some really dynamic companies, uh, great people, trends in the market space. Where is all this headed? Right. Okay. So the vision for the image. So one thing to clarify. So the company is Insight Links, and one day Insight Links will have a dozen newsletters. Uh, the imaging wire is specifically focused on imaging. It's my first newsletter, and the vision okay. for that is that I have a ton of subscribers who absolutely love to read it and a whole bunch of sponsors who are so pleased to be sponsoring it because people are clicking on their links and learning about them and going to their content. Uh, in short term, that is my vision. All I'm going to do is really just focus on those two things, growing our subscriber list and making sure that my sponsors are delighted. Uh, but longer term, I'm looking at other specialties and looking at healthcare IT and something that might not necessarily be specialty based, but it's super important. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, hopefully we're talking this time next year and we have you know, three or four newsletters. Yeah, that's exciting. Maybe I won't even write all of them. <laughs> uh, what do you think is a good uh, niche or specialty within healthcare that really needs this type of uh, brevity journalism? Mm, trick question, trick question there. Um, golly, uh, there, there's so many, Things that are going on right now, right? Um, Kyle and I, we, we talk about these things, right? Some of the things that are happening in healthcare. Um, I, I tell you what was for me, like, you know, was learning more about patient engagement, patient experience, and how important that was uh, for, pay, for hospitals to be competitive and to build brand and uh, candidly uh, recognition. Uh, yes, telemedicine, you know, how that's also been around, but now yeah. there's, reimbur let's talk about reimbursement. Now there's reimbursement for telemedicine. Now it's being adopted very broadly and how that's changing the way we do point of care now for a lot of people. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I, if I just see the doctor on my phone versus having to drive across town and sit in the waiting room or being told to take my measure and go hop in my car and they'll call me, I, right? That'd be great. Sign me um, up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really important, um, especially so I think like simplifying. So here's a great example. Uh, we all buy from Amazon. Right, and if you ever have an issue, you have a bot. You can talk to the bot. Uh, they know who you are. They can help you get an answer typically within a pretty good time frame. But when you talk to your doctor's office, it's not always so great. Um, and there, you know, there's just that they're siloed in some ways. So I mean, I think that's an area that we're going to see some improvement on. But also to your point, like on the imaging side and the AI, fascinating stuff because you go back towards uh, breast, right? Breast CAD, you can go back 10 years ago. Look how that's evolved where now it's used in lung cancer detection. Now uh, we're seeing some, some pretty dynamic companies come forward who are looking at this within digital pathology. They're calling it computational pathology, right? So you're talking about the stethoscope, you know, people want to get rid of the microscope. So right. all, we're seeing all kinds of things that are changing here pretty quickly. That's my look at it. That's why I, I see some things are, are happening, but I would love to see as a patient Improvements in just communications and managing my time versus, yeah. uh, you know, them controlling me for two or three hours. I'm just waiting to get seen. Right. What, what about you, Kyle? What's your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I, I think in, in February of 2020 or January of 2020, 
I would have called that the conversation consumerism. Mm -hmm. You know, and and how and we were talking about how health systems need to be think about the patient experience and about the patient. How do the, how do you consume healthcare now? Do I really want to drive to the hospital to take an X-ray, or can I get one down the street? You know, and and really leveraging you know, the information superhighway to use another old term, but it's really you know all that. And then now you see Walmart trying to trying and. I, it seems like they're, they're altering a little bit in their vision of, of getting into healthcare, but telemedicine is really just an aspect of what I say is consumerism, and how do we, how do we as consumers? You, you mentioned Amazon, perfect example. That's how we buy and sell goods in in many cases. So medicine needs to get with the program, and, right. and I mean that with respectfully. And, and I still see my primary care provider, but I don't always have to go see my doc for everything. And I think right. we need to kind of get past that mentality, you know, and that's, and another example is if you look at the rise of urgent care centers, mm -hmm. yeah. they wouldn't be exist on every freaking corner if they weren't filling a need. Right. And so old school, big, big building providers that I'm have my, most of my career attached to don't necessarily see it that way. They're like, Oh no, you have to have this long standing relationship. I'm like, well, not everything. Some care really is episodic. True. Like, just have a cough. Just, just, you know, I don't yeah. need, I don't need all that. So, so yeah, I would say that consumerism aspect, which is not just there's telemedicine, there's technology to that, but there's also yeah. marketing. There's also a, a actual health aspect. There's a lot of different circles that have to come together to really shape where healthcare is going. And I think not everybody's on the board, the boat yet. And there's, Cool things happening around wearables in that space too, which could, you know, feed into it because people essentially want to have this. Um, well, some people, I, I don't actually care to do it for myself, but want to uh, monitor and be able to, to beam over their, their vitals and essentially uh, be involved. Um, and I, I think the way technology is going in the way that um, I, I guess the the personal involvement in health and wellness here going. I think that they're gonna they're gonna ask for that type of um, kind of interconnection and also the experience. Like you said, I'm pretty sure my personal care physician does everything with like a clipboard. And uh, yeah, well, I think you said it best. Be involved. You know, there's yeah. a difference. You know, if I watch my parents' interactions. They go to the doctor. The doctor says, take this. My dad doesn't know, know what it is he takes. He just knows he's supposed to take it. Doesn't know what it is or why. Yeah. And I think people today want to have that ownership and be involved in that. And, and that's really, it's, it's changing. Okay. I'm not bringing it back to imaging. Because that's, until I watch those other news, newsletters, that's all I really know about. Uh, there, there's, there's an angle towards um, actually at-home ultrasound. And that's actually one of the ways mm -hmm. that they would get uh, that that personal use, whether and it's uh, the idea is that that AI guidance will get so good, and the the connection will get so good that since you can perform your own ultrasound, whether you're uh, okay. pregnant or have some other type of condition, have it in your home, but then have the um, the the scan get beamed over to the experts. Right. So. Oh. Mm. That has so. Sorry, I, that that just sits a nerve. I mean, if, if there was a way to do this to where it would be simple to train someone on that. Yeah. Think of how that think of how that would truly change the world. For sure. Incredible. Every sonographer who's listening to this like absolutely hates this conversation we're having. But uh um but maybe they're on the other end. You know, there's so I mean let, let's let's take a contrary point of view for a moment. There are some interesting other things that have to deal with that. So for a while there was these um pop up three D or four D uh, ultrasound clinics even in shopping malls. Uh, for OB, for, for pregnant women, you get mm -hmm. super great yeah. pictures of your baby, far better than you'll get at your uh, OG, yeah, OBGYN. But there there are some problems. You know, what happens when you're doing a home ultrasound and you see something like a deformity or, you you know, there's there's some there are some other things without having that care and someone right there to talk to you at that moment to explain what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. There are there's so, you know. I'm right there for you, sonographers. There, there are some <laughs> downsides to the technology, and, and I think it's you know it's not all rah rah. There are some you know you do it wrong, or 
there's a mistake in the AI, or you find something and you're not equipped to, and what do you do? The patient's going to go out to do deadmd.com and search Google this, and they're going to find like uh -huh. you know, a lot <laughs> right. of information and a lot of misinformation. And so that's yeah. that's why our doctors are, I mean, that's, you go to them as the, the expert to interpret and put all of this in context for you. See, this is why telemedicine has to be ubiquitous now, right? Because people right. are going to just become emotional. They're going to be able to go right to their doc and feed them the stream, and they're going to look at it and calm them down. Come into the office. We'll have our sonographer come and do a deeper dive on this, and we'll educate you as to what's really going on. That's and it, what he happen. said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like, as we were talking about AI earlier, uh, Clinicians are all just going to have to evolve the way that they work along with the technology. So mm -hmm. if that means that there's at-home ultrasounds, then you have to be adept at talking people through the findings. And if it means uh, AI streamlined a big portion of your job, it means you have to be adept at um, translating that or uh, finding the areas that might have gone wrong or communicating with the other folks on your team. And uh, same thing with you know all of us. Uh, there's things that we probably get paid for now. I mean, they, somebody's going to write an AI program that's going to write succinct newsletter someday. Uh, <laughs> so, so we better uh, continue to you know sharpen the axe and, and, yep. um, and figure right. out how we add value to the world. And if we enjoy this while we can, right? Before they automate all these things that we take for granted. Or just build 12 newsletters as fast as possible and then you know, you know, sell it to somebody. Well, I think... Go ahead, Kyle. I'm sorry. I was saying, I hope that I'm a sponsor in, in, in 12 months. I hope that uh, intelligent imaging is uh, takes off and I'll, I'll be up there at the top of your sponsors. <laughs> before the well, I got to tell you, Kyle, so we have a 12 sponsor limit and we're at 11 right now, starting on Monday. So, <laughs> ah, well, congrats. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That is well, sorry, there's 15 stories per issue and you can't have more advertisements than you have television program. Right? <laughs> um, so I said it at 12. So, uh, I hope for my sake, I still don't have that other slot open for you, Kyle, in a year from now. <laughs> but but right. uh, I, I would love to work with you. Always. No. Uh, well, you know, I'll be, I'll be, a, I'll be a, always a fan and a reader and, a, and a pushing it out on LinkedIn to, to my followers. Mm -hmm. So, Jake, we think we think you're doing part of the Lord's work here, World Bear Insights. So, this is great stuff. We'd, like to, we'd love to see you succeed at this and grow the business and come back and have further conversation about what's changing. Uh, Thank you. And uh, what a delightful conversation we just had. I have one question for you. So, Jake, yeah. as, a, as the outsider, you know, yeah. you read all the articles, you know what the industry is doing. What are we missing? What, what should we be focusing on as an industry that you don't see us talking about? Uh, or you as a patient or, you know, just. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, so one thing I think the industry misses sometimes is that because everybody has been in this industry forever and their emails are X-ray Steve, uh, they, uh, they're they missing the outside context about how sometimes something is actually really normal in other industries or been around forever and they feel like it's this problem that's unique to, to healthcare. Uh, <laughs> like what? Like, uh, uh, like uh, industry consolidation or um like uh consumerization or and there's so much to learn from the rest of the world i mean you have all these just brilliant companies really smart people creating best practices everywhere uh and healthcare is insular and that's fine um no it's not fine it's understandable uh but i, I think that's a really big thing there's a lot of times where um because you know i i didn't even think about uh imaging until i was 38 but i was i've been working for a living since I was 16. So I'll see all these different things. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, they're really positioned this as novel, but really it's like, I've seen this with, you know, the printing industry or, or whatever else. Um, and I think that there's a lot that can be uh, learned from that outside context. Uh, but it's like, you know, people get their health, their medical device sales job or marketing job when they're 22 out of college and then they're in for life. And it's because this industry is awesome. Um, but there's a lot of just outside context there. And that's actually, I think, one of the reasons that we see, for example, Butterfly doing such cool marketing is because they have to do consumer style marketing with that product. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they bring in all these kind of disciplines and best practices that um, 
you know, aren't so revolutionary if you're like a Samsung smartphone marketing person, but when you're comparing it against like these modality OEMs that have been doing this thing for 40 years, it's, they, they blow them away. Um, and I think that, that there's a lot of things that you can, um, or 80 years, uh, there's a lot of things that, that this industry can do, uh, without reinventing the wheel because the wheel has just been invented elsewhere. That's really insightful. I'm glad you said it. I mean, that, that's, uh, We'll have to cut that and put that in the very front. <laughs> or, there you go. That's that's the gem for everybody who stayed with us through uh, through the whole discussion. So uh, that was a great question, Kyle. I mean, that was definitely something that you know he had to like completely pivot to know <laughs> the, the answer. So yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I saw the look question. on your face. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a minute, uh, but uh, yeah, um, it, that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. All right. Cool. So one more time, where do people go to sign up for the imaging wire? And uh, we'll yeah. put this on the bottom of the screen somewhere. Uh, right. Uh, it's theimagingwire.com. Very straightforward. Go there, sign up. Uh, it's made for newsletters. So you might go to the site and see that it's there on the site, and you're welcome to use it that way. Um, but you're more guaranteed to be caught up on the news uh, every Monday and Thursday if you have it go to your, your inbox. Subscribe. Jake needs do it for Jake. Subscribe. Do it, for, do it for my sponsors. Too. There you go. Oh, you know, we love them too. But all you got to do is put your email address in, hit the subscribe button, boom, it'll come right to you. You can, as Jake said, you can open it up, read it while you're uh, having your coffee in the morning. I always do. And um, you know, I, I highly recommend it. Really, really insightful and um, love it. Like uh, that's, that's why I spend my 17 seconds to decide which, uh, which article I'm going to read. That's right. Now you can tell when you click on it, like, oh, I like that one. <laughs> Love it. Cool. Wayne, any, any parting thoughts? No, Jake, this is fun and learned a lot. Um, definitely your wealth of knowledge. And like I said, we're looking forward, excited to see that you're out there and you're growing this. So we'd love to come back and have further conversation. So thank you. Well, let's do it. I look forward to seeing you guys in person at a, uh, at, at a show sometime. So nice Cheers. to meet you. Ah, Cheers. Well done. Ah, All right. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Thanks. Thank you as well. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. Take care. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye bye.